our agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Um, I have one adjustment to the agenda and under item two, approval of school board minutes, I would like you to add special meeting of February 25th, 1993. I recognize the superintendent. And I've added to the superintendent's report a computer demonstration and explanation by one of our fourth grade teachers, our fourth grade team leader, Andrew Lomack McNair, who has brought his equipment with him. Are there any other adjustments? Seeing none, we move on to approval of the school board minutes for the meeting of February 9th, 1993. Are there any adjustments to the minutes of the meeting? Seeing none, they stand. Uh, the special meeting of February 25th, 1993. Are there any adjustments? You should have a revised uh, minutes on your added to your package seeing none they stand we next move on to comments by the high school uh, representatives hello if any of you had been through our school in the past week you would have seen that we were um, in the middle of celebrating March Madness um, by the efforts of Aaron Pond and, uh, and Corey Harmon we were able to transform each hallway into a different theme um, to collaborate with Foreign Language Week. And we also, there was also class competitions in games such as basketball, to the tug of war, to even Trivial Pursuit and Taboo. It was a lot of fun and it was a nice break in between the sports seasons. It, it was a big su success and there was a lot of attendance after school. Um, the co whole community is invited to the one act play tomorrow night at seven o'clock it's called vital signs it's been um, it's done by the theater workshop and mr. with mr. Mullen um, they will go on from there from tomorrow night to compete statewide as they do every year and they see much success with it and lastly today myself and some SAC members travel to Yarmouth to investigate their um, schedule their 90-minute periods um, I, I personally saw it as a very positive change. Everybody was more relaxed. There was more of a positive, less rushed atmosphere. There was overall happiness with it because nobody felt that they weren't getting enough time to teach. Although some of the students said that the teacher, some teachers lectured for that 90 minute period, there were more that concentrated on stuff, on, on programs such as the Foxfire program and, and, more, and dealt with issues more creatively. So I, thought, I saw it as a very positive change and I think it could be positive in Cape Elizabeth also. Um, the students also liked the one hour lunch, I'd like to mention. They had an hour, the whole school had an hour to do anything they wanted to. They could spend 20 minutes on lunch and socialize for the rest of the time and they even held some meetings during that, that hour long period. So it, it was a very good experience. Thank you. Courtney, how long is their school day? They go from around 8 o'clock to 2.20. Thank you. They, they have a, a rotating schedule. They have blue day and white day. And they have about three or, I went to three classes, but I think they have four classes a day. Mindy, did the students that went that attended classes that were more of a lecture format, did they, do you know what subjects those were? Um, somebody mentioned calculus. Um, <coughs> <laughs> it was it, it was just it wasn't a subject it was more teachers who hadn't kind of grasped the concept of, of uh, changing their teaching is style. this their first year or uh, yeah I, I believe so I'm not sure they might have extended it last year but I don't think they went to 90 minute periods in previous years so. thank you very much Courtney I don't believe we have middle school representatives this evening due to illness and someone just returning from Spain so we will move on to communications. Thank you. Uh, I included a couple of things in your packet. Uh, a memo to the uh, member, to Michael McGovern, actually, regarding uh, some of the discussions we had last month following one of our budget workshops on a legal issue. Um, I included a, a notification from the town clerk's office about Portland Water District trustee election. I assume that's because in case any of you are not busy enough, <laughs> you might like to want to run the water district. Um, and the uh, minutes from the February 11th meeting of the diversity committee. And that was it for communications. 
Any other communications? We now move on to the superintendent's report, first being a panel discussion of the learning gap. I just want to, again, I, the, the snow situation is so <laughs> depressing that uh, it's very difficult to know uh, what's going to go up and what isn't. As a matter of fact, listening to the announcement for the school play, I'm sitting here thinking that some of us are going to have to be at a building committee meeting tomorrow night. Uh, so I wish you good luck, and I'm sure it will be wonderful, but uh, some of us won't be able to be there. Uh, in addition, however, on Thursday, we have planned, and I've mentioned this before, and I just want to remind people this is an attempt to get the community involved, uh, at least to some degree, in a discussion of educational reform, some of the pros and cons of the discussion that is out there in our country. Um, this particular book, The Learning Gap, is trying to uh, analyze some of the, some aspects of uh, the Asian um, elementary school systems as compared to uh, some of our uh, American school systems. It's a complicated subject, and one of the things that I, it's, it's occurred to me as I've tried to explain to people why I want to promote such discussions, under no circumstances do I want to be seen as saying that the Japanese or the Chinese or whatever, whatever the, the third group was uh, Taipei, Taiwan, have, would not want in any way to say I think they have invented something that we should copy. I think what's interesting is to realize that it was America who really pioneered the idea of why broad-based public uh, education and uh, many of those uh, uh, the countries that are certainly uh, analyzed to some degree in this particular <laughs> book were only picking up what we had done and translating it to their culture and uh, frankly making in some cases it more efficient. We have, however, two different cultures. It's important to understand that. I uh, appreciated your comments on that, Andrew. Um, and to realize that uh, the, the point of discussions like this is to continue the community dialogue about what does this community want to do, what is appropriate, what can we learn from uh, other cultures, uh, and uh, what do we have to look at in our own practice. So in that spirit, we are going to present a panel discussion Hope people will be there. I understand it's going to be food. One of our parents has volunteered to bring food, so if anybody needs a little pick-me-up in the evening. And I have absolutely no idea what the weather is going to be like, um, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. As far as snow days are concerned, since I'm on that topic, uh, the basis of snow days is that the calendar as published every year, tries to estimate when the last day of school will be. All of this is, however, against a backdrop that the state mandates 175 teacher-pupil days with an additional five days for teachers. Frankly, we should start in August and just keep going. And when we get 175 teacher-pupil days, that's the end of school. Um, it isn't as if we have five freebies built into our calendar and that every day is a day off. We just the reason those snow days are built in that way is just to give us an estimate for when the last day of school will be. We have now used four of the five days that we had put into the calendar. Uh, if you look at your calendars, we do distribute those widely, you can see uh, what the uh, current last day of school would be, what? Pardon me? 23rd. 23rd of June. Maybe we should, we should probably dust off our 4th of July units. <laughs> and uh, realize that we're about to experiment year-round schooling. Um, I have no way of coping with this that anybody else doesn't have. I just we'll do the best we can. I'm, I'm tempted to keep school open and say, get there if you can. But I have the obligation of conferring with the road crew in the morning and other superintendents and trying to be reasonable about this. But um, I wish it would stop snowing. Thank you. Uh, I think we should go right on to ask um, Andrew Lomick-McNair to explain his material. Uh, during our last budget workshop, we got into computers. We had, I think, uh, a lively and productive discussion followed by an administrative meeting. Uh, we did take advantage of a snow day on Friday to uh, really cover quite a lot of, of ground. And uh, when we get to the budget, I will share with all of you some of our thinking about picking up on your direction at that uh, workshop. But I thought it would be interesting, since the fourth grade 
uh, is doing and has been doing uh, along with some of the other grades at Pond Cove uh, a number of interesting things and I want to point out we wanted to let the Pond Cove Parent Teachers Association as well as the school board know what we were doing with the computers so you're on. Thank you I'd like to thank the board and I'd like to this evening give a presentation, an overview of some of the ways that we are using computers in the fourth grade. And if it's possible, if we can dim the lights, it will make the screen a little bit brighter for us. We'll be able to see this a little bit better. Um, we have a very extensive and comprehensive African American Studies unit in the fourth grade. One of the ideas that we came up with this year was trying to incorporate computer use into this unit. The very first thing that we decided to do was create some timelines. Uh, fourth grade children need to have a visual reference, a reference point to work with, and the computer has a <coughs> program called TimeMiner, and it does exactly that. We created a series of timelines starting 1620, going right through, I'm not going to roll these all out and pull them up, but I'll just show you sort of what the children are working with right now. These are up in every single one of the fourth grade classrooms. And underneath them, we brainstorm with the children, all of their, getting all of their back, background knowledge on what they know, what they know about uh, African American studies. It surprised us, to tell you the truth. We were really surprised what the children did already know. We then put together a research unit for them, and this is where the computer has really been helpful. Up on the screen, you'll see uh, what's called a folder. Inside the folder, we have a set of hypercard stacks. And I'm afraid if I get one more wire up here, I'll probably end up <laughs> Uh, but inside these, this folder, there are a series of stacks. And the stacks are designed for African Amer notable African American uh, personages. They, children research and then put information into the computer in a variety of different ways. We think that the children are, right now, they, they find it enticing. Uh, I'm going to open this up. By the way, the, the little sort of cable underneath the folder means that this is a shared folder and that any of the other five classrooms can access this. They're networked. So when the children go to put their information in, all of the five different classrooms, the other five classrooms would be able to access that information. The first thing that we ran into is logistically you need to be able to get 22 children onto one computer. The PCPA last year funded us to get six computers, so we have one per classroom. How do you managerially get them onto the computer? So what we did was to create uh, research learning groups. There are four children researching the African Americans, and then they will put the information in. And they are currently doing the research, and I'll go ahead and open this up. And they have very uh, specific guidelines and directions on how to do the research and then how to get it into, into the computer itself. Let me darken this just a little bit. I'm going to show you a completed HyperCard stack. These are called stacks. They actually look like a stack of cards because they, on the computer, look like a series of cards and the children put information into the cards. The first card that comes up is their, <coughs> their title card. <coughs> they would have blank templates to work with. And if they were working with Rosa Parks or they were researching Scott Joplin, uh, we have 30 different notable African Americans, they would have a blank template to put their information in. Theirs would be blanked. They would simply come in, click right here, and type in the information. 
completing their title card. The very same with the authors themselves. The children are very well aware <coughs> that they put in their entire name also because they are taking ownership of it. These are created very simply. We wanted to make a very simple model for success to make it easy enough for the students as well as the teachers to learn and use. So this is a very simple program and very simple uh, hypercard stack. They have a menu to choose from. There are four different cards that they need to complete. We decided that they needed to have very clear guidelines, parameters to do the research. In other words, when children and fourth graders often go to do research, they may not have any idea of what they need to find. So we decided to put in guidelines. They have to create a timeline for each one of the African Americans that they're researching. They're doing this in groups. They're going to their resources. We have all three libraries right now that have compiled books for us and put them all together. We have them in the rooms. The children check them out. They do the research, and they have to come up with 10 days and create a timeline. Within each date, they have information. These buttons are created for them. They just click on them and type in the information into this window. The idea being that they create an entire timeline. And one of the PCPA members the other day said, can you print this out? And you actually can. It would be interesting to see if it were printed out from the first date right through to the end of the life, what type of fluidity it had, if it, uh, if it sounded like a report or not. That's one of the things we want to sort of look at as we continue with this. They would have to enter information for each one of the dates right through to the end of this person's life. All of the notable events in their life. One of the nice uh, aspects of the windows that they are typing in is that you'll notice on the right uh, what looks like a scroll bar. They could put in over 33,000 words if they really got going on their research, they could put in that much. Uh, after they create the timelines, they have to go in and actually put the dates onto the buttons. This is probably the only part about this program that it is even slightly tricky. I had a little apprehension, will the children be able to do this part? I watched them do it today and they had no trouble at all. They went right through it. They didn't even need uh, a teacher's supervision on it. In order to put the dates on, they have to go up to the tools menu, to that little button, the icon, double click on the button and type in the date. That's the most difficult part of the program for them to master. And they have very clearly written directions. So they, uh, working in groups, we usually find the uh, they're, they're, we, when we put the groups together, we put, the, put them together according to compatibility and computer knowledge. And there are always a couple of kids who say, I know how to do that, and they put it in very quickly. They go back to the main menu. And then choose the next card. I'm going to go over to famous quotes first. After they have on their note cards put the 10 dates, put the 10 dates and the information on, they have to come up with a quote that best represents the African American they're researching. In this case with Martin Luther King, it was very easy to do. They type it, click on that button and type the quote into the window, and then they have to actually speak the quote in. We have very sophisticated Macintosh LC2s. And in order to really optimize their use, we wanted to have them using the sound input as well as typing. And as you'll see in a minute, actually scan pictures into these biography stacks. In this case, this quote 
was spoken right through the microphone. When we let freedom ring and it goes right into the computer. This is digitized every sound. Every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I think you can imagine what part of this program the children really want to be, what they're really vying for. We actually talk about that in, in some of our uh, discussions. We talk about how are you going to resolve that as a group? They come up with marvelous ideas. Maybe we could do it line by line. Maybe we could do it in unison. So they really have thought about it and have worked out some of their own problems and hurdles to get to this point. This part, it would seem like this might be a difficult, uh, a difficult part of the program for them to master. I'd like to show you real quickly just how easy it is. They go to audio and a tape recorder comes up. It is really that simple. That type of voice input is, is very easy. They would click on, these are buttons by the way, you probably heard me referring to these, but they click on the record button, record the sound, click on the stop button, and another button pops up and says, what would you like to name me? They can call it uh, anything they would like and then drag it any place on the card. I have underneath the, uh, the card, right down in the corner, set, I, I have a little uh, typewritten message that says, put it here, because they may want to put it somewhere else. So the idea is that it then lines it up with all of the others. We're trying to make it very simple for them, but also give them all of the different parts of the computer that they can use, meaning they can uh, put in voice, they can put in uh, word processing documents, all of the research. They would then go back to the main menu. We have scanned pictures that they bring and essentially cut and paste right into the stack. And then they get to create one more sound. This sound they get to be very creative with. For instance, if they're researching Scott Joplin, it makes sense to have them put in some ragtime music. If they are researching Jackie Robinson, it might be a good idea to have the roar of a uh, crowd in the stadium. So they get to be creative. And again, I think this is the part they're most looking forward to. The last part of their biography stack is a biography card. This is a very simple card with, again, a set of windows that they have to put information in. Simply enough, they would research, find date of birth, maybe talk about some of the aspects of uh, what happened, what was going on in the world, or the, the uh, part of the country that they grew up in, anything about their birth, childhood, young adulthood, adulthood. Then the next three are we think fairly important to the staff. Hurdles, accomplishments, and recognition. And the children are very well aware of what hurdles are. They understand that uh, analogy, that it is something very difficult to overcome. In Martin Luther King's case, Martin was jailed many times for his activities to help create equal rights. For black Americans, his home was bombed during the bus boycott of Montgomery. He was also that year stabbed with a letter opener and had he sneezed would have died. And I haven't put that in, but uh, one, of, one of those little bits that the children would probably have come up with and put into the window. Accomplishments and recognition. Because they are doing so many different um, African Americans, we had to come up with a set of Sort of guidelines for them for all of this. Uh, people like Wilma Rudolph, who didn't walk until she was eight and then turned around and won uh, three gold medals in the 1960s Olympics. And those types of uh, recognition and accomplishments would go in, would fit very well here. I should mention also that one 
of the uses that we are finding very, very helpful in the fourth grade, the teachers have created databases for the libraries that they have in the rooms. The databases are very simple. It allows them to select using Boolean logic, actually just saying a, an and or, I want to have all of the books from Thomas Memorial and Pond Cove, and it will give them just that list. They're finding this extremely helpful. So the, uh, all in all, we're finding the computer use is really taking off right now. And I'd like to ask if there are any questions, anything that I can answer about this. When you put this together, first question, you were proficient in hypercard before you put that together. Um, so <coughs> would be included in your prep time. Can you just ask me how many hours is the lesson plan that you described as that? For, for the creation of this itself, I can do it in about an hour and a half. Um, I should mention hypercard is a program that when you create the, the scripting language for it, it sounds more like English than any other programming language. The button at the bottom that says exit, the commands behind that go something like this. On mouse up, go to the next card, or go to the previous card. It is that simple. It doesn't, doesn't require a great deal for um, teachers to learn how to use it. It's a very simple parts of hypercard that uh, teachers can use. Ren Wilkinson is doing an incredible job using hypercard in third grade. And I've actually had fourth graders come up who know enough scripting language to create um, their own hypercard stacks. Uh, last year I had, I had a child who was very proficient in it. And he, he went to town. <laughs> he was very, very good at it. Any other questions? You have one computer in your classroom. Yes. Would it make any difference if you had five? It would certainly alleviate having the difficulty of getting the kids on the computer in the groups. We have a, a set of incentives right now. The first group that comes to the teacher with their note cards in order, grammatically correct, ready to go, they get to work on the computer first. That's a big incentive. Um, in truth, I don't think that you have the space to have five in a room. I do think two is ideal. Part of it is that there are many times when a teacher needs to use a computer, and a child will need to use a computer, and you have to work that out. Uh, I use this overhead projector all the time. And Many of the other teachers do. It's on a rotating basis. We, we share this. If you have children creating while a teacher is using this to present something, that to me is ideal. This, uh, this by the way, is a screensaver. So if it looks like everything's gone haywire on here, it hasn't. Uh, I, I truly don't believe that, and, and this came up in, computer, in the computer committee, that that five is ideal. Um, two possibly could be ideal, and then of course uh, computer labs are always. <coughs> um, there was one other point. Andrew, yeah. would you explain how all 135 students in fourth grade will have this opportunity? Excellent. That was exactly what I was thinking. Also, because they are working in groups. Because there is enough for them to put into the computer with the, the, uh, all of the different items in the stack, the four or five will come to the computer and work for an hour. The next day, uh, a group will come up and work. The idea being that with five African-American biography stacks being produced by each classroom, we will have, at the end of this, an incredible database we will have over 30 of these biography stats. We've toyed with the idea of having a scavenger hunt after that, later in the year, where the children had to go in and, and using the network, go into the other stacks to get information about African Americans. 
That way they're not only learning about their own person or the people in the classroom, but all of the other African Americans that we've researched. That is the biggest hurdle, to get enough children onto the computer. Uh, right now, they are queuing up to come in at recess in order to do their work. That, that's how motivated they are. I, I was telling Beth that I wish I could have videoed in the room this morning the children doing their research in groups. It was one of those moments in the classroom you love to see. They were so involved in opening up the books from the libraries and finding the information, getting it onto note cards to get into the computer. That uh, type of motivation is wonderful to see. Andrew, how much staff development to bring all fourth grade teachers online? At this point, fourth grade, the fourth grade teachers are moving along very quickly. Uh, they're very enthusiastic. That's a difficult question for me to answer. I wouldn't know uh, the amount of time that it would take. There's so many areas that you have to learn about in the computer. Um, I how think at one point, Frank, did we come up with a an amount of time in computer committee as far as, I know Ren and I have talked about it at one point. And for the training of the teachers, uh, we're, we're looking somewhere between three and five days depending on what people want to do. <coughs> um, the certainly a, a, at least three two hour sessions to get them really going. With it. Right now, the, the teachers are producing an enormous amount of documents, the curriculum guidelines that have been developed are all being done on the computer. One advantage to the networking is we only need one printer. That part has really been wonderful. And the printer, thank goodness, is quiet. It's in my room and going constantly. <laughs> we barely hear it. But I, I would estimate uh, at, at least three good, solid two-hour sessions in order to really get uh, people familiar with and comfortable with it. Once they're comfortable with it, they will go in and start learning more about it. How much time to do this particular pro I know you put a lot of time into it, but I mean working with other teachers to get them comfortable. At this point, I have, we've had a few afternoon after school sessions, and we've done uh, three or four, and then a lot of what we might call mini sessions, or a mini tutoring, where I run around and just troubleshoot and help out as much as possible. But most of them are feeling very comfortable with it right now. In order to work with the hypercard, you would need some good in servicing, some good staff development on it. And I know Ren, uh, Ren Wilkinson is the same way. We, we talked that we both like working with hypercard. It's, uh, it is, Apple has always maintained that it's a terrific teaching tool. You can create an amazing amount of things. I've got stacks that, uh, show all sorts of different things from protractor use right through, and they're very easy to create. I, I think it's wonderful what you're doing, and I feel very lucky that I have a child who's getting the benefit of this. It's, it's just fantastic. Um, do, what is the end product of this um, for the kids? Is it go going to stay in the computer? Or are they going to get a copy of the... I have told the them they worked on. Good question. And, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Joey was asking me if he could, well, can I take this home and work on it? Those students who have Macintoshes, and it's unfortunate, but there are platforms in computers that we have to sort of abide by. Those that have Macintoshes may bring in a disk and it takes about 10 seconds to copy it on and they would be able to take, take it with them. Great. And, some of where this moves is towards electronic portfolios eventually. Mm -hmm. This is something that we see in a lot of different areas right now. Any questions? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. That was, uh, you know, I, when you say one picture is worth a thousand words, I think when we were talking about computers the other night, yeah, it occurred to us that it would be a good um, opportunity for the board to see some of what's going on in applications. Thank you very much and I really appreciate your, I wasn't aware that you were going to try to bring a 
the whole thing. I thought maybe you were just going to explain what you're doing, but this is much more powerful to bring it with you. One of the nice parts about this is that you get to see how we can also use this in presentations to supplement teaching, uh, to supplement the lessons themselves. We have some programs that have very current databases on them, uh, Mac Globe, Mac USA. These programs give us information that is 1992 or 1993, it's current, and it's very, very powerful. At one point, we were using it almost daily in the room, and it gives you an idea of how we can also present it to the children. The overhead projection systems are, uh, at, back to the original question about would it be better to have five, I think these are more important mm -hmm. right now. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions, I'll move on. We thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. The next uh, piece of my report, and I've really done this well tonight because I've had everybody else doing it but me. Uh, Lyle Kramer is here uh, to talk about the eighth grade MEA assessment scores, which you have a copy of in your packet as well as a copy of Lyle's uh, summary. You're going to use the hypercard, Lyle? <laughs> You're going to use the hypercard? Connie mentioned that you folks have a long agenda tonight. So what I'll do instead of going through the booklet, as I usually do, I'll just touch upon the uh, written report that you folks have. I'll try to highlight the high points. Um, usually I mention the fact that all of the students in the eighth grade uh, have taken the test this year three students are not included in the school-wide scores because a couple of the students uh, did not do anything on some of the sub, on what, at least one of the subtests. So that when a student doesn't do any work on a subtest, that's counted as, as void, and that kind of voids that student's whole score. Uh, with a, in another situation, uh, we've had a student who has extensive absenteeism and that person was in school enough during the two weeks that we gave the test and the makeup so that we could get more than a couple of tests administered. So that's the reason that three of us, those are the reasons why three of our students are not included in the scores. Otherwise, everybody did take the test and all of our students took at least some parts of the test. If you look down towards the bottom of the page, I have listed the scores for the 1992-93 school year in grade eight. In reading, they were 375, in writing 345, in math 400, science 400. Social studies was not administered this year as a budget, state budget uh, savings. And in the humanities area, our score was 390. Um, all of our scores have increased during the past two years so that you will see three years there in a row where the, school, where the scores have increased in all of the areas in which they were tested. Then I mentioned the gender gap again. The gender gap is still with us in two subjects, that's reading and writing, and instead of the usual gender gap where the girls are behind in math and science. In our school, the boys tend to be significantly behind in reading and writing by scores of 82 and 103. And those scores represent almost, in one case, in excess of one set of, in one case, in excess of two standard deviations, and in the other case, just under two standard deviations, and that's a very significant difference statistically. That is a pattern that has been pretty prevalent for quite a few years now. At the top of page two, I expand on the gender differences both here at Cape Elizabeth and for the state as a whole. You can see that, again, our girls 
uh, outscore the boys by a lot more than the girls outscore the boys at the state level. And then when you get down to the math and science area, um, our boys hold their own. I mean, I'm sorry, the girls, again, do better than the boys. Um, wrapping up the report, you folks usually ask that I compare the students in grade four scores to those in grade eight. That is, how did the, this year's current grade eight students do when they were fourth graders? And I've made that comparison so that for this grade level, in reading at grade four, they scored at 335. This year, 375. In writing, grade four, 330. Uh, 345 this year. In math, grade four scores were 365, 400 this year. In science, 325 in grade four, 400 this year. Humanities, 325 in grade four, and 390 this year. Uh, also, you folks have requested that I break that down by individual student so that you folks can take a look at the number of students individually who have improved the scores. That is not included in your report because this report came to me just last week. These, these results, for instance, have not come out in the main Sunday Telegram yet, and I just did not have time to break those out and do individual comparisons because of the uh, three or four days that I had to prepare this report to get it to you so that you could have it in your packets for, for tonight. What I'll do with your permission is to do that study and then present that to you when I present the grade four scores late in the spring or early summer. Do you have any questions? I, I have one comment. I, I think these are wonderful scores and I always personally judge whether I think they're good scores by the comparison between fourth grade and eighth grade and what happens in those four years. And so I, I would like to commend the middle school for what's happened in the last four years. They've gone up in every area and they've gone up by 75, 60, 75 points. And I think this is very good and, and I'm just very pleased. One thing I should point out too, that sometimes there's a misunderstanding when we use these standard scores that compare school to school, the, the scores that I present here have nothing to do with individual scores. What they really do is put those, put the schools in the state of Maine on a bell-shaped curve, and these scores represent percentile scores of schools that would be in like the 97th to the 99th percentile range. So when you see, because there are so few schools that score in the upper 300s, you're looking at just probably two or three schools in the state that would be at the same score as our lowest score. But that would also have been true in fourth grade, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, I, I, yes, I did not yeah. mean that to relate back to your comment. It was, it was a point that I forgot to mention as I was going through. The, I would also like to echo that. It is very reassuring to see a lot of success in the middle school. The, and one of the most um, exciting parts to me is the math score after having instituted a pretty aggressive math program, very much understanding what we were undertaking and seeing that not only is, are the scores holding with the introduction of a new system, but it already maybe is improving some proficiency in math skills. The thing that is still very, very concerning to me is the writing piece. Um, the, although the numbers are improved, if we look at writing in terms of a band score, um, the writing results, because of our geographic and uh, other considerations of our school population, we're expected to score 340 to 375. And uh, in every other area, we're scoring on the high end of our expected range, as we would hope, except for in writing, where we have consistently scored in the lower range. Although it's improved, we're on the very bottom edge of that, that suggested grouping for our t typical s schools that are typical for our um, students. And the other thing that is, I, th I think, really frightening is that if you look at the boys in writing, you're at 290. And that, that's what you're referring that's to as the two standard deviations away. Yes. 
it, when you're looking statistically, you know, boys are up by 25, girls are up by 28. Those are not statistically significant findings. I mean, in an overall picture of how things go. But if you're looking at two standard deviations away for a group performing on a test score, that's an enormous finding, I think, from these, these test scores. Um, the other thing that is oftentimes argued is that, well, the MEA is not really what we're interested in, in terms of trying to define what we're trying to learn. The thing that is consistent for me is that the most, con the most consistent concern brought to me by parents about this group is writing. They just feel that the writing is not technically up to snuff, that uh, there's a lot of creati creative writing being done. The kids enjoy writing, but when it comes to technical writing, addressing essay questions, they're simply unable to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think these scores bear that out. Uh, whereas the math system we have looked at extensively, there's a very clearly defined curriculum. It's being in place with a lot of in-servicing and scores are seeming to be improved. I don't have any of those feelings for the writing curriculum. It's not clear to me how it is addressed from a K-12 strand. It's not clear to me specifically in the middle school how it is to be addressed, the exact assessment tools used, and how we know whether the curriculum currently being used meets the students' needs are all very unclear to me. Um, I don't want to sound defensive, but I go back to my point, too, that when you're looking at the number of schools that fall into that three standard deviations above the mean, you're looking at a half a dozen schools mm -hmm. across the state. So we fall well into, we fell, fall well into a very small number of schools uh, statewide in terms of quality of writing. Um, I think that our, I know that our middle school teachers have been workshopped. They've had many workshops and, and the writing program was one of the first programs that we implemented extensively and, and our teachers have done a, a tremendous amount of work in the writing process. Um, I think that perhaps one of the reasons we, you haven't heard about it a lot is that that's kind of been in place for a long time. We've given a lot more attention to reading and some and the math programs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand your concern about the boys. One of the things that I've observed, and I think that this applies to boys some, I'm seeing, just observing, I don't have any documentation for this, but I'm seeing motivation play a tremendous role, I think in the amount that we come down from the top compared to, to other schools. Um, I think the fact that some students didn't do enough to, on, a, on certain aspects of the test to have a score even register, um, I think that that is the beginning of, of some indication that, that we need to look more at motivation. One of the other things that happened in one of the other areas of testing was uh, the study that Nancy Hutton did in conjunction with some of the people at the state level, and that is where the reading scores were down in the open-ended reading responses because the students had not gone the extra, followed the directions precisely to read the passage. They tried to answer the questions without reading, and I, and I think that this, I think that motivation I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand motivation at all. I mean, they were motivated to complete the math part, but I, I can't understand a kid saying, well, I'm going to work really hard on my MEAs, but this part I'm just not motivated by. What makes more sense to me is a kid gets to the point and says, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm not really going to spend a lot of time addressing it. The concept is, if you know it, do it. If you don't know it, skip ahead and continue on. Hitting something they feel uncomfortable with not addressing it, i.e. they're not motivated to it because they don't feel confident in addressing the question and moving on to something they feel more confident to. I, I, I can't understand an exclusive lack of motivation in a certain part of the test. Well, I, I think that uh, motivation is, is perhaps not the word that, that I would uh, choose first, maybe it's second, but I wonder how many of them knew how important it was to answer those questions fully and you know, what was expected uh, when they're giving, what do they call it, a writing prompt, that they ought to have a couple of paragraphs. They ought to have 10 sentences. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the dimensions are, but have they been adequately uh, coached, if you will, as to what's expected on these types of questions that are, have, that are open-ended?
Miami score comes solely from the writing prompt. For their given time, it's, it's an issue to, it's a, and I don't, what the prompt was this year is totally escaping me at this moment. It would be handy if I could remember it, but I don't. It's so, how's, I, I do remember it. Oh, good. I, I didn't do it. I don't have a score to report. But uh, I think it was uh, described something that turned out differently than you expected. Than you expected. That, that is but, uh, and I'm making, uh, I was lumping the two together, but I was, I think uh, the question on coaching goes to both the open-ended questions and to the writing prompt. And I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, are they coached uh, fairly extensively as to what's expected? in terms of answers? We, I think there's a fine line between coaching and doing too little coaching and too much coaching. And uh, I've worked with our teachers and I'm sure that our teachers have talked to the, te to the students a fair amount about the importance of the test and how you should try your best. Um, if we go much beyond that in a testing situation like this, then there are there's strict limits as to how much we should do to teach more to the test than teach good writing skills. Well, I'm not advocating teaching to the test. I'm just advocating making it clear to the students what types of questions these are and what at least what length answer is required. That's, that's done. Okay. But I, I think that that, that simply sure. would go to the argument that they will do what's expected of them and they are creatures of habit whereas if they are routinely handing in something like they're handing in on the MEA and this and it's going coming back as well you know that's all right then when they get that prompt in the MEA they're likely to respond with us in a similar vein if in a prompt in the classroom they're expected to perform to a certain standard they receive some comparable prompt in an MEA they should perform to that standard as apparently other children are throughout the state and so I don't think that it's something that we should say, oh, this is a peculiarity of the MEAs that we're going to coach our kids for. I think that the way to address that would be in the classroom to expect a certain level of proficiency in their writing, and then that would carry through on their performance in the MEA. Well, my, my other comment, too, is and it kind of refers to the same argument that you used. Uh, if it's a question of not teaching or not, or not preparing adequately or not giving adequate instruction, then how come our girls score well into the 400s? I don't know the answer and to that. And why is it that the boys are the ones who don't do that? I think that that's a legitimate question. And I was just going to add to that. I think several years ago when we got our test results back and we had not done well, and um, I particularly looked in reading, especially at our responses at the open-ended questions because I really felt we should do a lot better than that than we did and we picked up some hints that perhaps our students weren't answering the questions thoroughly I think this year's performance is indicating that they are getting better at that we'll need to check again next year and make sure that's a consistent performance for the strategies we've tried to put in our instruction which is being sure that you answer questions completely and thoroughly and that you attend to the text when you're responding to the question and not relying on, oh, yeah, I think that's probably close enough. Now, in the writing prompt, which is the writing score comes solely from that writing prompt. The open-ended questions are part of the reading score. That one, our students do write to prompts a lot. I know they start in the elementary school, and they continue on through the middle school. So it's a process that they're fairly familiar with. We also use the same criteria uh, many of the teachers use different kinds of scoring grids, but all based on the same criteria that really came out of MEA. And if you go into our seventh grade language arts classrooms, you see the old analytic scoring guide is a big mega grid for writing in both Jill Blackwood's classroom and Bev Bisbee's classroom. So the students are well aware of the standards. And I think we need to investigate. We can always go back and investigate why, why are they still only doing a 330 in that. But also, one of the motivation may come in with an interest element in how interesting do they find the prompt. And many times the students will actually do better writing for the classroom teacher than they do on the MEA. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's because they think, well, I, I think I've done enough on this prompt and that's about how interested I am and I've, I've tried to do it, but I don't find it particularly captivating, so I'm going to do this. Um, the prompts are written to be accessible to students across the state 
And many times, prompts we use in our classroom are, of course, more specific to kinds of things that we're trying to do in Cape Elizabeth. So there is a difference in the type of prompts, even though prompts, the whole process of writing to prompts is something that they're used to and that they have practiced and is a normal part of their curriculum. So I think we are trying to address those things um, and to look at them. In, in looking at the writing results and looking at what was uh, scored as far as the areas of topic development, organization, details, sentences, wording, mechanics, looking at those commendations and needs, mm -hmm. what areas do you feel that we should be concentrating more, that, that our students are, are well, lacking in the writing process? And, and I haven't had time to analyze these. Now I can't even find the right page. Um, page, eight. page eight. Page eight. Page eight. <clears throat> One of the things that, if you look at um, the commendations and needs, what has happened and still seems to be happening is that our students who write well seem to capture topic development pretty well, and they get going with that. They may fall down in organization and perhaps sometimes supporting details, which means they, start, they have a grasp of what they're supposed to do. And then how thoroughly they choose to do it may be something that we need to address. As you notice, we have quite a few commendations in topic development, um, and then we get down to fewer commendations in organization and details, but there's still 43 for organization, 57 for details. We have, when we look at the needs, it also seems to be our students who have difficulty in writing don't seem to grasp what the point of the prompt is. And I haven't analyzed these scores, but three years ago, when I, or two years ago, when I analyzed the other scores with Fred Cheney, when we looked at some of our writers who scored in the different um, percentile points, in our students who scored low, they really had a difficult time getting started in their writing. And I would say that that may still be true for some of our writers. You will notice when we look down at the um, things of sentence structure, wording, and mechanics, our pointage and needs there um, for wording is, is only eight for um, the, the percentage for um, Mechanics is only 16, so um, those aren't the areas that are, are coming across as tremendous need. It seems to be more in developing that. And what we're finding, and in the work that I've done with MEA, um, it would be really reflective of once they get started on how to write and working with that, depending upon where they are with that developmentally, then they begin to focus in on that and get a better grasp for it. Can, and, I, can I just ask, though, um, it, it basically appears that the writing scores have been stalled for a number of years, between 345 and 8990, then it went down and then went up a little bit, and now we're back to 345 again. And, you know, I, it, since I've been on the board, we continue to hear that this area is being worked on, but basically, you know, we're back where we started a, a few years ago. And I just wonder what is being done differently in the curriculum besides you know, uh, telling kids how important the test is and, and that kind of thing as far as the writing curriculum I, I think to help a, them a, with these a, issues. A more thorough focus on technical writing, um, expository writing, different kinds of writing uh, for that. Also, the 345 that they receive now um, is a higher score than one before because the writing across the state has improved. So the writing is a better quality um, than it was. It still is a 345 and it still is something that we're looking at and it means we need to continue working on it. I think things like our work with the grammar subcommittee or the grammar committee that's also going to look at research skills. I think that are looking at the kinds of things we're asking students to do or work on assessment with the assessment mini grants and continuing on that. I think that all begins to fold into kinds of things that we're going to see with improvement. But in writing we started out doing very well and um, so there is going to be some regression for that because that's just part of statistically what happens, they tell me. But also, we need to be aware of that and try to attend to that and address that. And I think that we are trying to do that in our curriculums. It's not an overnight process. But I think we are still addressing it and we haven't, we haven't figured that we have arrived in our writing curriculum, that we're still working on that. Are, are some of these boys the same boys who are now, you know, going going on into the high school needing remedial services also? I mean, we're not talking about special special ed boys who, who, are, who are scoring low. Are there just a large well, number of boys? 
who need remedial services in, in um, the reading and writing areas? I don't know that I have the information to answer that. I can tell you of our students who have been recommended for an English skills class, there are 11. Seven of them are boys, but more than seven boys took this exam and, and wrote to this prompt. So um, I don't know that that, how strongly that impacts the situation. Any other questions? We may be able to address that question about the number of boys when I look at the most scores on an individual basis. We thank you very much. Thank you. We now move on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first is the Finance Subcommittee and the Chairman, Rosemary Reed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to report that the Finance uh, Subcommittee met uh, immediately before this meeting and discussed the budget, which I will defer until the agenda item uh, later on. And I would also say that we signed warrants and we reviewed the uh, financial, uh, both the revenue and the expenditure side uh, of the business manager's report. And with two-thirds of the year gone, we are pretty much on target with 67% of our allocation received and a 67.5% uh, of uh, our total budget spent. No remarkable points. May I ask one question since I didn't attend your meeting for the first time. I apologize. Can you just give me, um, or maybe the business manager, an overview of what's happening in food service? We seem to be suffering a few lo more losses than we have in the past. I don't want to belabor it, but just. Snow days have anything to do with it, Dave? I don't know about snow days, but uh, February wasn't a good month because of the, uh, basically the uh, week's vacation, third week of February. Uh, I guess I've met with Sue King and what we'd like to do is, uh, I've looked over last year, we we're about a couple thousand dollars below last year revenues as far as uh, basically at the high school. Uh, we had projected we'd be down about $5,000 based on, on the revenues at the high school. The food, the inventories are pretty much online as, as last year. Hopefully, I believe if I recall right, the, uh, the estimated, to date we're, for year to date, we had a $22,980,000 loss as far as cash flow. Add the $15,000 for the, uh, what the district contributes to the program. Uh, plus we started off with $8,000 of a loss or a decrease in the fund balance uh, for 92.93. So all in all, we're at $16,027 in the red. March is usually a good month if, if it stops snowing, I guess. Uh, at this time of year, we are looking at inventories. We're gonna try to deplete the inventories. Commodities have come in fairly well throughout the year compared to other years. We've received a lot of the, the meats and other products that the USDA puts out. Uh, I guess all in all, uh, um, I hear your question, Charlie, but I'm not really prepared to answer it. But okay. looking at last year's numbers, we're about two to three thousand dollars behind. The only reason I'm asking it is, is in a budget context, we did drop last year from twenty-five thousand to fifteen thousand the school's allocation. Maybe we need to to revisit that before we can, you know, confirm our budget. We visited revisited last year <coughs> with the. Uh, with the, even the $10,000 drop, we were projecting that by June 30th of this year, that the fund balance would, that $8,047 that we started off would be coming out in the black. And so far, I think we can meet that. I thought we were gonna write off uh, the results every year and start every year with a zero fund balance. We put all of the 15, well, we, we kind of did that, Peter. Uh, well, not if in, in September, which was your first month, you started out with, if that, if the cash balance it shows there is the same as the fund balance, well, the, you didn't start at a zero. 
Well, the cash balance would have been the 7453. We we transferred all the 15,000 that was in the general budget to to subsidize food services in September. Yeah, but then it would seem to me the only entry would be the $15,000 plus the operations for that month. It plus sounds like you ended on August 31st with a fund balance of uh, $8,047, negative. That's correct. Uh, didn't we agree we weren't going to do that? We agree yes, that every well, year, but we just don't do it, right? No, but see, by the time, by the time the transfer is done, like the, the money set aside for like this year, 92, 93, it's, it's in the budget to be transferred after July 1st. You know, when, when you appropriate the $15,000 to the budget process for 92, 93, the money becomes available to be transferred on you know, July 1st. At that point. I'm sorry, yeah. I stand corrected. July but 1st is when you zero it out. It's July 1st is when I, we transfer the whatever is appropriate in the general program to fund school lunch activities to the school lunch activity fund or school lunch fund. I think what he's asking, are we carrying, are we carrying a negative balance into the new the new budget year and I think we are and I think the board's direction was as of June 31st unless you had encumbrances uh, was to to zero out that account and start with whatever we allocated for the next year which would start you in the black which start us zero or even it well, would start you at 15,000 start with 15,000 yeah. that would be your fund balance I think this is what's confusing, and when we get to a certain point, and it looks like we're, lo we're losing money, sometimes we aren't losing as much as what it appears on your reports, because you're still carrying a negative balance from last year, trying to wipe it out. That's correct. And I think we're asking you to, to close that account essentially out, and with a negative balance, and we, lo we had a loss for the year, hmm. and we start out with whatever we allocate. <coughs> in the budget process as, as a for the fund to up, start yeah. the year. Yeah, see the importance of doing that is if it is a negative number uh, and, but, at the, but at the same time you have a positive cash, uh, you have an unused contingency account. Uh, we, we even agreed to zero out the contingency account every year and start again so it didn't look like we were squirreling money away. We zero out all the accounts, right? And there's only one number at the end of the year on June 30th and that's in effect cash balances, net cash. No contingency account, yeah. no deficit uh, in the fund balance for the lunch program. I hear you. So the, the, but then I guess, okay, but the audit would have to be like performed before we really close, you know, some of the books, you know, in order to, 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 to verify what the fund balance in school lunch is as of June, let's say 25th or whenever we close the program and do the entries before June 30th. So well, that, I yeah, the, the, usually you have closing entries, they, but they take place quite often in, in August or sure. in, in July, uh, sometime prior to the final audit, which is issued. When's the audit issued? Doesn't reach August, until August, September, August. September, yeah. so. October. That's fine. I just, I was concerned because we seem to be losing more money. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we have budgeted enough allocation to meet that need since we had dropped it in last year's budget process. Thank you. Um, that brought me back to uh, page 65D. I think the, the headings are wrong. 65 right here. The headings are wrong. The board should correct the, uh, you've got two year ends of 92, 93. Yeah. Well, it should be 92, 93. No, this is comparing, I'm sorry. This is comparing Jenny, the first column, column C is comparing what happened as of January 31st, column D should be 228.93. We're comparing one month to the, to the next. So basically the fund balance went from a positive 37.58 at the end of January to a negative 12, uh, to, a, to a positive 12.71 or a decrease of almost $2,500 in February. Basically, it's mostly, if you note up, up, up on top, it's mostly in, uh, in revenues as far as receipts, where there's a decrease of $7,700. The inventories are about the same, and the unpaid bills are, are down or to the plus of almost 5000 
Well, I, I feel better realizing, uh, looking at this number, if you'll remember in October we had a meeting regarding the um, cafeteria and we were supposed to revisit this in uh, March um, to find out what the cause of the loss was. But if you're carrying forward that negative balance still on this long-term report, then that would answer but I guess, uh, uh, a lot of that. Sure, and, and maybe for the next finance subcommittee meeting we should, uh, we can have a proposal or an estimated year-end proposal for uh, for anticipated uh, balance for school lunch. Any other questions? Jan? Just a comment. If February was a bad month because of the school vacation, then maybe better planning could take place for next year because we have that vacation every single year. It's not a new thing. So. I guess I guess what happens too in February is 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 how out how the the food comes in how the unpaid bills versus paid bills your labor costs some of the labor costs uh, are rolled in because of, of payrolls in January that are actually paid in February like the last week of January plus it's only I forget how many days of school but there's there wasn't that many days of actual revenues uh, good point but then I guess we need to buy accordingly is what you know, the inventory is in pretty good shape. What we need to do now is deplete the inventory so that come June 30th, we, we don't have the food on hand and we have that turn into, into, uh, into cash. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to the policy subcommittee and right upon our chairman. Yes. Uh, the policy subcommittee met on March 3rd at 9.30 with the principals and Dr. Goldman. And we do not have a policy for you tonight, but we will have it next time. Um, we have worked two months on the student placement policy, and actually this is like three policies, and we have, have come up with some good ideas for the high school, some changes that we feel like will be beneficial to the high school placement, student placement. Uh, I think we've resolved the middle school, but we're our discussion really is still stemming on the, uh, the K through six part of the student placement policy. And, uh, and I think we've made good progress and we'll be able to tie that up at our next meeting, which will be April the 7th at, at 9.30 in the morning. Um, and we'll have that policy for you in your packet next month. And hopefully we'll have the second reading in time for that policy to be in place as the teachers make their decisions on children in classrooms for the coming year. Thank you. So that'll be Wednesday, April 7th? Yes. Correct. 9.30. Well, <clears throat> yes, I was going to ask after a meeting. Um, I've developed a conflict, and I was going to ask people to examine their calendars, which you may not have with you, and see if we can possibly ship that to the next day. But we'll just have to uh, I'll just raise the issue now, and we can resolve that. Perhaps later. We'll have this published, though, so that people yes. will know. Yes. Yes. It's kind of giving public notice yes. now. If anybody's <coughs> interested, then you should check with us. Okay. Next is the Middle School Building Committee. And I really haven't asked anybody to <laughs> comment <laughs> on it. Uh, I will. I'll let the superintendent. That's, uh, uh, anybody that's ever had anything to do with planning major projects knows that it's really an intensive time and, and frankly, a lot of time <coughs> goes into it. Uh, we've had two meetings with our newly hired architectural engineering firm um, and have followed a very rigorous agenda that's been laid out for both of those meetings. We have another one tomorrow night. Um, what we are clearly getting into is a phase of making some crunch decisions about uh, how we're going to approach the renovation needs at both <coughs> Middle School and Pond Cove because it's becoming more uh, clear to us that the site issues, those two buildings being so close, traffic problems, parking problems, playing field problems, sports field problems, we really cannot any longer look at one building without looking at the whole campus. Uh, the last uh, meeting ended with uh, two pieces of uh, business that, that will probably have to be ongoing. One is pretty well done, the other one ongoing. First one, update of enrollment projections. I just received that today, as a matter of fact, I haven't had a chance to study it myself, but uh, it does raise some interesting questions about the possibility that we're seeing with a large uh, kindergarten class this year, the first of four or five such 
large glasses, which I find somewhat, um, well, raising some questions. Uh, but more on that later at the building committee tomorrow. And the other issue is that uh, we are looking at um, going into a major traffic study because as we look at the site, it seems to be impossible to sort out how we alter uh, the site that we have, particularly in, this, in respect to some of the things we consider unsafe in traffic patterns, parking patterns, et cetera without involving the high school and to some degree without involving the um, other municipal services that border on the school campus. Um, we are committed to trying to unsnarl as many of these long-standing problems as possible. Uh, and we do bring, I commend the building committee and all the members thereof um, and the teacher and administration group that's coming as an advisory group. A lot of energy, a lot of good ideas and um, we have, we're gonna make some progress. Thank you. Uh, school calendar committee. I don't know who's. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, usually the school board waits until the, uh, till almost the end of the school year before we talk about the calendar. And, and basically, I think we just rubber stamp you know, a form that's pretty much like the year before. This year, we're taking a different approach, and we're going to uh, take a little more time to uh, have school board members and the superintendent. and. Uh, administrators sit down and really talk about the calendar and see if uh, if there's some adjustments adjustments to the calendar we could make we just had our first meeting today uh, Connie was there Jan Solon and I were there Rick Defusco Nancy St. John Beth Henderson um, and we will uh, be having another meeting on March 23rd at 3:30, where hopefully we can make some real progress on firming up the calendar for next year any questions well, actually, I should just say, if anybody at home, any parents or anybody has any comments about the calendar, now is the time to mm. make them. <laughs> That's true. Thank you very much. In fact, we have no unfinished business, so we will go right into new business. And the first would be a discussion and action of the proposed physical 94 budget. And I will yield to the superintendent. Okay. <coughs> uh, after our last board workshop, um, this Thursday, uh, and the administrators and I met on Friday. I prepared a memo for you. I think everybody now has a copy. Um, the upshot of it is, is summarized. Um, the cuts that you have uh, authorized so far and some other suggestions are summarized on a separate sheet. I do realize in discussing with the Finance Subcommittee, I neglected to put in a piece that you had discussed and agreed to cut, and that was a proposed increase in social worker at Pond Cove. So actually, to that list of cuts, we should ask to add a 6,912 piece, making a total of 155,677 for cuts. And just to summarize for people who don't have this sheet in front of them, we authorized a $13,000 cut from special education. Uh, contracted services line. Um, the middle school request for additional time for a social worker was cut. Computer hardware was cut. $9,000 of the request at least was cut. Pond Cove School, after much discussion, um, you're going with a reduction in the number of first grade sections. Uh, you're also taking a uh, some of the requests for computer hardware at Pond Cove School. At the high school, a request uh, for additional social studies time has been cut. System-wide, uh, $15,000 piece from salaries. General salary adjustment, uh, uh, this is a piece that you have not discussed so far. Uh, two pieces that I added after um, reviewing the situation. Uh, I did say at the beginning when I brought in the budget that I had put some money in there to try to uh, cover some kind of modest cost of living adjustments for all staff uh, after reviewing all a number of possibilities including some of our continued reorganization in a couple of fields including <laughs> possibly nursing services um, I'm taking 35 out of that I also brought in a very large piece on the ADA projects that we uh, explained at the our last workshop that we don't have a line by line budget to support that, that I had taken some generalized sums that were given me by the um, 
maintenance people, explaining that our new maintenance director really hasn't had time to prepare a proper line-by-line -line budget, so it was really an estimation. So given the budget crunch, I've taken 25000 out of that line. If you add all of that up, including the piece on the projected uh, increase in social work at Pine Cove, the total cut so far, 155677. Now, I've also included in your packet, or in that, uh, along with that, and a kind of an explanation of that, plus on the back of the sheet there are responses to your concerns about computer education. Uh, I believe we, we administrators, we got together and discussed what we saw as some sort of policy level discussions. I'll go down through what we are suggesting as a way to deal with that. This is not so much a money issue as it is a response to a reorganization in a sense of what we intend to accomplish. Uh, we agree with you that staff development should become our first priority. We will come back to you with a detailed budget using the approximately $8,000 already in budget lines from each cost center. That is a total of $8,000 from each. Uh, it adds up to. We see this program is tied to the board directive that all staff will become computer trained within the next three years. I understand that there was a, an effort in the district in the past to um, highlight various curriculum initiatives and you can argue that we'd like to do it faster than three years, but at the same time, we're suggesting that that's a reasonable time frame. We will organize a system-wide course to be offered after school in a manner similar to the current exceptionality course, which is taught by a combination of in-house and outside staff. We will also make funds available to support staff taking courses through community service, summer school courses, and area business opportunities. There is, are some computer uh, businesses in, in the Portland area that from time to time uh, offer courses and our budget will include some uh, capacity to try to support individual staff members taking those opportunities. Number two, we will promote both through the system-wide course and through informal opportunities awareness of what student applications are already in place and that can be replicated through peer coaching. We just saw a wonderful example of that I think this evening. Um, I know that at the fourth grade level, that Andrew, and at the third grade level, Ren Wilkinson, uh, two people who have surfaced as teachers interested in computer applications are in fact doing a lot of peer coaching to um, uh, make these things available. Uh, I understand that other teachers in other areas, I know Bev Bisbee at the seventh grade, and um, we have uh, people like Buddy Earl at the fifth grade who are also trying to do similar things. And that, I think, is an informal and sometimes overlooked way of increasing staff development in computers, but I think it's one of the most powerful ways because it's tied directly to applications. The, um, also, we will involve staff in the efforts to expand our library capacity for research. Uh, we've already talked about expanding the, um, the database bank kinds of things we have in the library. Number three, the middle school curriculum will be revamped to put emphasis on student abilities to use word processing and spreadsheet applications. The aim will be to send students to the high school prepared to use computers as a tool to help them use increasingly sophisticated applications. One of the issues that's very evident, and I think you again saw it tonight, is that children are now coming into school with very uh, different backgrounds and their interest and level of sophistication in computers depending on home experience. It's another one of those things. We see differences in, in a, a lot of ways with children depending on what the interests of the family are. We're still going to have to wrestle with what are the equity issues, what are the availability access to machinery, what kind of machinery, what kind of programs. Those are all part of what we will be dealing with in, in service and staff development. The other piece I want to call your attention to in <coughs> summary is that I asked uh, Dee to run off three cover sheets for you. Um, we'll just have to adjust this slightly because I, because of adding in that other $7,000 piece. You may recall that the budget I brought in first had a tax uh, impact of a little over a dollar. We, when I brought it into you, I said and chunked out for you where the different increases were coming from. I thought that it was a fair representation of the various kinds of needs that we were trying to cope with. I pointed out what per pupil expenses 
if you look at the uh, track record of the last four budgets, including this one, I pointed out that we were actually bringing in a fairly cost-effective per pupil increase given the increase in um, total enrollment. The effect on the tax rate, and I think that is the bottom line, there's no question that when we get to this point in budgets, um, if we had unlimited funds, perhaps we did an unlimited, unlimited budget. I'm not sure that that would be the case, but perhaps. But certainly at this point, uh, you need to consider that. So one of the ways in which to look at the effects is to see what um, the budget, just taking the 155000 out, that brings the tax rate down to uh, 75 cents, which is a reduction of a quarter of what I brought in originally. Originally, I also pointed out to you that the ADA line, a uh, fairly large line, can be capitalized, or at least I suggested that I had discuss that with the town manager. I knew that the municipal side of the budget will, in all likelihood, carry some kind of monies for ADA projects because it is a municipal obligation, not just a school obligation. I do not know at this point uh, exactly how they intend to handle it, but uh, we have had a prior conversation that it would be the kind of thing, the projects in it, would be uh, likely to be uh, capitalized, probably th three-year loan. There are some loans that we have already started to investigate that are available to school systems at less uh, interest than it would be the standard bank rate. I don't know exactly what the details of that would be, but at any rate, it would be the kind of thing. If then you took $100,000 of that project out and capitalized it, the, ta the impact on the tax rate would be 58 cents. So to go from a dollar, what was it originally, dollar seven? <clears throat> now, does that include the debt service? Yes, it does. So the 17000 that remains is the debt service? This would be the debt service. So right. it's a... Or an approximation. A 10-year note or something? Yes, yeah, so it would be a three-year note or something. Well, um, a three-year note, the debt service would be more than... It might... Oh, well, I see. It would just be the first year. That's that right. Exactly. Gotcha. And... Um, you know, I, that's not a hard figure. These are we're dealing with sort of approximations at this point. Now, my, I need to caution you that you cannot adopt the budget uh, with the 58 cents. You have to bring forward whatever you want to include for any expenses that you request to be capitalized. That becomes your budget. You then take that budget to the council and explain that you, as we did last year, that this is a, uh, a proper piece to be capitalized. You would request that it be capitalized uh, and um, go forward with it with that information in mind. In other words, if it is capitalized, then the effect on the tax rate is 58 cents. Any questions? Any comments? Um, since the, under general salary, salary adjustments, including possible realignment of nursing services, are you at a point where you can tell us where you're headed? Which part of that? Uh, realignment of nursing services, is that a reduction in nursing, nursing services or is that going to? Well, I don't have, um, I don't have a real clear picture at this point. I do, however, have enough information to lead me to believe that we will be bringing back a a proposal. Uh, you may recall we have we really have three part-time nurses, uh, and we have found that we had to increase hours in our health aid at Fond Cove, and we've had some discussion with our nursing staff about uh, how to balance those resources. Um, therefore, I, I, that number does not include a large sum. I'm just calling to your attention that I believe that I will be bringing back as part of the ongoing discussion of programs for next year. But since I think it would probably include a small reduction in what we are now spending, I just wanted to surface it as part of the budget. But I do not have uh, enough data to tell you exactly what that would be. Did we implement last year a kind of a triage training and program? We did, in fact, have some training. Um, I don't think, however, that we have fully implemented all the recommendations that we came up with. Um, we certainly are moving in that direction. Um, my goal is a laminated card at every telephone, but I don't think we've gotten that far. Uh, we certainly uh, made sure that the nurses had a training session for secretarial staff, um, people who would be likely to be kind of first-line um, 
people that kids would be coming into because that was a, really what sparked the discussion was our concern that a child might have an accident on the playground or come in and nobody really had the full picture uh, so that part of the thing was to develop a procedure so that uh, whoever the youngster talked to uh, whether it was somebody right there on the spot outside or a secretary um, could make sure that we asked the right questions we moved in that direction but I'm not I can't tell you that it's a, a perfect procedure at this point but we do know that of all the things that come up in the discussion about nursing services we can't possibly put enough nurses in the system to respond as a medical professional to every possible incident what we need is a procedure um, we had some discussion with our in-house expert on that one but um, uh, it's it's a troubling issue and one that uh, we just have to keep working on the nurses in our elementary and middle school are involved in some curriculum delivery, correct? Mm -hmm. The social worker that we have presently in our <coughs> elementary school is also involved in some curriculum delivery, correct? I'm not sure that Pam does much curriculum delivery. Does Pam what? do? No, not as part of the six day rotation. Okay. What is Sarah? Is she a guidance or is she a. Okay. Okay, thank you. I had, I had one comment to make since I was the most vocal about the computer program at our last budget hearing. And uh, I... Are you looking for my summary? No, I had. In a newsletter that came from the uh, Maine School Management Association, there was an article from Education Today, which was dated in February, and it was talking about uh, computer integration of computer into classroom instruction. And it was interesting that one of the things that was, that was highly recommended in budgeting for hardware, software, and staff development that staff development should take about 25% of what you budget initially for hardware and software costs. So it's, it's very important that your staff is, is online and is able to implement whatever you buy them to provide for the students. So I strongly, even though I was very vocal about the direction that I felt that our computer curriculum was going, that I strongly support um, staff development and I, that's, that's got to be on board first and that we need to also look at the curriculum and, as a whole and reevaluate it. But staff development is strictly number one priority and I think that was quite evident tonight in Andrew's presentation. That if you don't have the staff on board that have the knowledge and expertise, it's useless to have the hardware and software sitting there. Ian. Just on, on that same topic, um, Connie, when, when might we expect to have a, more of an idea what the staff development might be like and what kind of timeline and how we would make sure people were getting the training they needed? Well, I think we talked about that Friday. Nancy, I think you were going to take some responsibility since the <coughs> middle school was sort of the focus of, of the curriculum issue and you were going to come back. I think you said right. two weeks, but I'm not sure. Right. I, well. Just to let you know, we did hear the message from last Thursday night. And first of all, for our curriculum update, because we're, look we're looking at that and then looking at um, what kind of staff development we would like. On Thursday, um, six people are going to meet to begin to look at rewriting, revisiting our curriculum grades four through eight. And we have three classroom teachers, Bev Bisbee, Buddy Earl, and Andrew Lomack McNear that are going to work on that group, with that group, and Marty Watts, Randy Perkins as our computer instructors, and also Hayden Atwood as our librarian, because one of the things we'd like to fold in is the library research. We hope to be able to come to you, and really our goal is to come to you by the May board meeting with an idea of a framework of what that new curriculum would look like. And we would put that in place for a year, and then need to revisit it as well again to see how far we get and where that would go. Now, it's with some of those ideas, and the group hasn't met, but things like um, mastering keyboarding, 
really looking at how to use the computer as a tool, um, databases and spreadsheets, and then connecting that with curriculum work that students could do, uh, maybe from a menu of choices with their different curriculum, different subject areas that they could use as they develop the spreadsheet with a particular area of interest that they would like to research further. Now, what our plan is to look at then staff development, and a group hasn't met um, regarding that so far, but I know that already Randy Perkins and Buddy Earl have signed up for a MAC leadership course this summer at the Harrison Middle School in Yarmouth, and one of our hopes is that then they will be able to come back and join a group of, of people that may include people like Andrew, people like Wren, um, people like Beverly, um, people at the high school that are computer proficient, and then they would develop the system-wide course that Connie mentioned. The other thing we would like to fold into that is something where they also work with the librarians and teachers have a very um, on hand understanding about how to use that technology and what the possibilities are. Hayden Atwood had already spoken to me last week about the possibilities of developing a course that we could use for certification credits um, to have teachers come in and use some of the equipment in the library and get to understand that better. And so this just seems to be a natural way to fold that in. So right now is a broad picture of the framework. We're looking at some of the basics of, of using the computer, but then also direct application for your classroom, uh, requirements that you might make of students, things that they would be able to do with it, understanding what HyperCard is, how you might build that and use that, and also folding in the library research. So I think our goal is to perhaps have that course ready to offer at the beginning of next year, whether it will be offered in September, or October, or November, that I'm not sure of, but that's one of our goals with that particular um, piece of this new design. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments? Come. One thing that I've come to realize about Andrew is that he's a very modest person, and I think it's important that you that you know about some of the work that he's done as well uh, with the fourth grade. He, I think he mentioned it, but just let me touch on it again. He did all the networking of those computers in the fourth grade wing that was going on this past August. He was in there climbing up on the ladder and underneath the tiles and fishing all that wire through. Uh, prior to school starting, he also did two half-day workshops with the fourth grade team. Um, and then uh, the, the piece that he talked about this evening, he did spend three days after school with the fourth grade team in, in preparing them. A lot of this was volunteer. Yes. And, and I, you know, I really think that I call this a support, and I think this should be considered a stipendary type of position, too. Well, one of the things that we're talking about in, in, in uh, developing these in-house courses, and obviously we'll be looking at ways of giving CEU credits or, you know, certification credits and encouraging people to look at their certification action plans and take advantage of that, which is really what that exceptionality course uh, uh, does also, we, we really want to give our people stipends for teaching those courses. And that um, I think that's an important concept and one that uh, we need to develop a specific budget and bring back with you uh, to you so that you can see what our thinking is. We may not need all that money that's in that line, as a matter of fact, but at the same time, we want to make sure that we are taking uh, steps to acknowledge what people are doing. Can, can we require that all teachers have computer training within three years? Oh, sure. We can require. We can't make it a condition of employment. Um, you know, it's one of those things that I wouldn't want to, to get ourselves into some kind of box where we said that somebody will fire you if you don't do this. Uh, other than that, sure, we can require it. I mean, we can make it in the sense of we, it's an expectation. And we'll also uh, be reasonable in the sense of drawing up their various avenues by which one can do this. And the reality will be that some people will be more, uh, more adept at it than others, but that, uh, frankly, what, what we certainly agree with you in the conversation we had the other night, that we are quickly getting to a point as teachers, um, we have to know this, and we have to recognize that children know it, um, and that uh, 
that that's going to be the world they're growing up, that is the world they're growing up in, and we need to understand it. Ann? Do, do you foresee at any point having that built into the evaluation plan for teachers at all? I would think that that certainly is, is uh, reasonable. I can't, I'd have to look at the, you know, what we've got in there exactly. I, I frankly, I, I have to tell you, I have absolute confidence in this staff from what I've seen in a variety of ways, that once they know what the expectation is, they will <coughs> do it. This is not something, this is not a staff where people, um, you know, get very uh, subversive about not doing things. But I do think we have to say, and that's where I think the board policy level discussions are important. You say, you know, I mean, I told you the other night, I felt when I walked into this district that there was some real ambivalences about what kind of commitment there was for the use of computers in the classroom. I, I don't mean necessarily you individuals as board members, but that the district itself, I saw lots of evidence that there was a lot of ambivalence. People weren't really sure that it was a scholarly thing to do. I mean, that was the impression I got from some of my discussions with parents as well as some teachers. And I think we've been working our way through a variety of processes and we've decided that's not good enough. Mark. One of the things that's unfortunate about being new to a board when you're cutting budgets is you don't get to play with great ideas in funding them. But one of the things that I had mentioned last year, which I would really continue to like to somehow revisit, and maybe it could be done on when co-curricular fees are renegotiated, is the concept of some grant money, like a two, a two five thousand dollar two year grants. In other words, twenty five hundred dollars a year. And that would be an open proposal by teachers, for instance, something that um, Andrew Lomack McNair could put together about this is, this is my proposal for $2,500 this year is to network the fourth grade and provide HyperStack, um, or hyper, excuse me, HyperCard in service to produce this social studies project. And, and as a board or as some subcommittee says, that is a great idea, we'll fund that for a year. And then in the after a year, you get this feedback, and you say, that is great. We should do it again. In fact, it's so great, we should expand it to the Pond Cove, and we'd make it $5,000. Or it's another easy example that we just recently visited was Ogden Williams Publishing, a $2,500 grant, so that the people who are really innovative, who are very committed to bringing about changes in our schools, can do that with some type, some type of reimbursement. And we can acknowledge them with, mo with money and resources to be able to continue that type of work. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> you may recall we have a small stipend of $500 in the budget from that, uh, that uh, concept that is part of the reworking of the teacher evaluation process. And we have a co-curricular meeting coming up, and one of the things that, that I promised to do was to work out we had some discussion about this. For instance, uh, you may recall earlier in the year, uh, we, we had a board level discussion about how many teachers get that $500 concept. Remember, we had the mass support people, and we had some discussion about whether that should include special ed, whether it should include, uh, uh, then we were concerned that we weren't really focusing on language arts at that point. So when we discussed that in our <clears throat> previous meeting on co-curricular, what came out of that discussion was a sense that each grade uh, would have $500 and that one school, and in Pankov's case, you have five uh, grades, that's five times 500 or $2,500, and that that money could be available for curriculum projects with a process spelled out as to who would, would okay it, uh, or it could be divided into subgroups of the $2,500. So that concept is emerging as we try to figure out, because we know that's what we wanted to do, it is not a whole lot of money, but it right now at least is, is a concept. So we probably will be bringing back to you when we bring the co-curricular list and so on, um, the wording that we just agree on to do just that kind of thing. Okay. Peter? Yeah, I just have one question. Well, first I'd, I'd really like to compliment the middle school one and, and uh, all the administrators for getting on this issue so quickly. A lot of what we talked about in the in terms of computers was really more a curriculum subject than a budget subject. And uh, I don't know quite how, even after five years on the board, how you coordinate that type of debate and dovetail those issues. But I just would like to say that I'd like to see the same uh, thing happening, uh, you know, in the high school in, in terms of 
of looking at redeploying existing assets. Uh, I think we discussed that um, so that uh, we can move ahead quickly, you know, in the high school so that the high school students are uh, able to benefit from the, uh, uh, you know, from, from the use of the computers. I, I feel it is so, the more I think about it and the more I think of all the people who I've, I've observed in business and all my own experiences, it is an absolutely essential tool. And uh, this may sound funny to you because, uh, you know, I guess for years I've been a, a champion of foreign language instruction at an early age, but, and certainly foreign languages were the tools that I used to earn my living, but watching Andrew Lomack McNair uh, introducing that type of program <coughs> in the fourth grade, uh, I get even more excited about that than I do uh, about foreign language instruction, which is one of our most successful programs. So I would just urge everybody to, you know, press on, whether it's in the budget context or whether the curriculum committee, to get the computer program off and running and put the emphasis first, I think we all agree, on the human resources, on the development of the individuals, the, particularly the teachers and the administrators. Well, at the high school, I didn't put it on the sheet because I, I wasn't uh, sure exactly where we were, but Frank and I had a chance to talk today after I had done this. Uh, we certainly agree with your comments that the, the so-called business program needs to be rethought, restructured with more emphasis on the use of computers. Um, I understand from Frank that he has had discussions with the teacher uh, involved and that there is uh, a, certainly a possibility. We, the sheets have already gone out for sign-ups. We have to really kind of see what it comes back, but that the, based on that and based on uh, I think what I regard as a policy level direction that you people are giving us, we would be happy to work through the resources we have at the high school at the present time from the short term for next year directly, what changes can be made, and secondly for the long term, you know, what kind of, is it time to really basically take all those resources and stop calling them business and start calling them some kind of computer instruction, but uh, we'll come back to you with some specifics. I would just like to comment on Anne's concern about t possible teacher reticence. I think as we look towards how we instruct ch children in computer usage and how we integrate delivery of uh, computer instruction for class, other curriculum deliveries, I think that it will send a, that that alone will send a message that that it'll be an expectation that that system-wide, this is how we approach, this is one way of how we approach teaching and delivering education. And if you're not on board, I mean, you're gonna essentially be ostracized. What's gonna drive this is the kids. Uh, I have a six-year-old grandson who can't write yet. I mean, he prints some things, but not much. I told his father the other day that, See, my arm is tired. I'm he had something to do for kindergarten, and he went down and turned on the computer and typed out whatever it was he was supposed to type out. I don't know what it looked like, but um, and, and this, you know, this is going on all around us, and these youngsters are going to be coming into school <coughs> uh, expecting to use uh, computers as a tool. It's going to be a fact of life. It's going to be, and teachers are not going to be able to ignore it. I mean. One of the things that breeds success is kids queuing up in recess, and teachers love to see kids involved. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind other teachers seeing that kind of thing are going to want to be involved in those kinds of projects. So as, as I think as we make those opportunities available, increasingly are more specific as to what kinds of hardware and software will fit the, the kinds of things we're talking about. And we're clear that we want it as a tool the kids will use and not be teaching you know, the first wave of classes was teaching the kids how to turn it on and don't be afraid of it and so forth. That wave is gone. I think that discussion we had the other night, it was clear to me that you all understand that. And when I talked to the administrators, we agree. Uh, so, you know, we'll get on with it. Yeah, I, I think we can be very confident of success, too. And I, I haven't observed anybody, and I've observed a lot of 40 or 50, even 60-year-old people initially afraid of computers, myself included, learn how to do it. It's a little painful in the beginning sometimes, but 
once people learn it, it's just like a bird taking wing. Uh, and I just wonder, has anybody observed anybody else, once they get into it, failing to like it, failing to use that tool? I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> you don't have to cite names. Wow. I don't think they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, in the workplace, once you have got over that initial um, introduction, and, you, and your life revolves around the use of the computer in just everyday delivery, when your computer system goes down and you have to go to a manual <laughs> system, I'll tell you, it's very archaic and it, it causes havoc. So it's just getting over that initial. That's what I was going to say to Peter, that working with computers daily, I hate them when they're not working. Uh, so that's the, the downside is they're not always working, but when they are, they're wonderful. And, a lot of people are in a job position right now that four years ago computer proficiency was not a requirement and now it is and outside of the school arena it is a condition of employment for many many firms so we're doing the right thing uh, kids who go to college they have a computer included in their uh, bill for books unless of course they're bringing a, an appropriate one with them so it's definitely what we need to do is there, yeah. Beth? I just, just had a, a thought as Nancy was talking about the, the middle school uh, writing scores. It might be interesting to look at what would happen to the boys if they were able to be involved with computer. In yeah, that's a real good point. That's a very good point. Um, I think that that may possibly, just looking at middle school boys and so forth, their interest in computers, it might elevate those scores. I don't think that opportunities there is Yes. While we're going, you know, waxing so eloquent on this, I, I'm just chilled to remember uh, a couple times, a couple summers ago, when the computers went down in the supermarket. <laughs> Has anyone ever had that experience? <laughs> And, and uh, they, they have to estimate, you know, how much the food costs, and the clerks are totally paralyzed. So let us not forget <laughs> that sometimes we don't have computers, and, you know, the basics are still going to be very, very important. And it's, it's a very good tool when it works, but it's, it's certainly not the answer to everything. So, sorry, that it, image just That's came right. into my mind. In talking to, in talking to uh, Connie on Monday about how her administrative council meeting went, and I feel that this is real. We now have five basic curriculums. We have math, science, um, language arts, social studies, and I think computers is, has to be equivalent. So you have to have the skills in all those other areas too. But in order to be successful in the outside world, they gotta have, be, have some knowledge of computers. Is there anybody from the public or the board that would like to look at what are proposed for cuts uh, wish to ask any questions, wish to challenge? Seeing none. Rosemary? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we um, approve the school board budget uh, $9,693,270. It's the right number. Sorry, what's oh, the you. number? 9693270 Nine million six nine three. Of all my handouts, I don't. Well, in your handout, yeah. the one that has a tax rate at seventy-five cents. If you look up at the total budget, it's nine seven zero zero one eight two. If you take six nine one two away from that, you come up with nine six nine three two seven zero. I assume that's what you're doing. My computer was down, but I used my pencil. Do I? Do I hear a second? Mark, a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, are uh, all those in favor? Seven zero. Good. Charlie, maybe we ought to say six major areas instead of five and include foreign language in that too. <laughs> I'll say that. I'll second that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, may I ask if the business manager has had an 
opportunity to find out uh, what percentage of an increase that represents, that number? It's 5.3 something. No is an acceptable answer. Thank you. And our projected enrollment is projected to increase by what percent? Well, the number I gave you originally based on where we were on kindergarten enrollments for next fall would be an increase over the last four years of 111 students. Now, you're about $40,000 away at this particular budget figure from a zero increase per pupil expenditure over four years, which I, it was a figure I brought you originally. You're not quite there yet, but it's, you're close to it. That's not a zero increase in the budget, but it's a zero increase in per pupil spending. Okay, we will move on to personnel requests. <laughs> versus resignation? Well, I have a letter here from Frank Miles, the principal of the high school, uh, who is letting us know that after five years here, he feels that it is time to move on. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to publicly thank Frank for uh, what I know has been a, a hard and very, um, very sincere and many times difficult uh, attention to the high school. I really feel that he has brought out some issues that needed to be brought out. I believe that he has worked with the staff to bring uh, some of the discussions that might have been going on in two separate rooms, bringing them together and having a faculty that could sit down and talk about its differences in philosophy and in some of the feelings they have about how to go about change. I personally, in the two and a half years that I have worked in the district, have seen a real improvement in the way that high school faculty sits at a meeting and talks about things. And I think Frank uh, deserves a lot of credit for that. So that at the same time that he is telling us that he is leaving us, I also want to thank him. I know that he's put his heart and soul into what he's done and appreciate what that is. I also would like to echo the superintendent's um, comments. Um, I remember coming on the board about three and a half years ago, and one of the first things that Loretta Pond said to me was, you need to get involved in the high school. You need to know what's going on. Your children will be there shortly. And I remember going to my first, I did get on a committee. A, we were, in fact, looking at gifted and talented, of all things. And going to my first high school committee, and seeing the polarized, essentially polarized um, areas of, of staff and, and looking over the last year of how that staff has come around and how they have opened up and areas that are no longer sacred and, um, and they, they don't guard their turf so, so protectively. It's, it's just such a transition. It's just in my three and a half years on the board, I know that Frank has seen a lot of transition just within the central staff and um, the administrative staff. I mean, um, essentially Frank and uh, Mr. DeFusco are, are the, the only original people on the administrative staff when I first came on the board. So there has been a big transition, <coughs> and of course, a transition at the top. And uh, I, again, thank him publicly on behalf of myself as a board member, and I, I think I speak for the board as a whole. Loretta. I, I would just like to say, I, I, in Frank's five years on the, uh, on the staff, he's had all three of my children, and I, I really do appreciate his service to Cape Elizabeth High School, and I wish him well in his future endeavors. Ian? And I'd just like to thank Frank for bringing up a lot of subjects we really need to deal with, and even if sometimes some of us had disagreements or differences of opinion, there, you brought up a lot of topics we really need to discuss, and we'll keep discussing them, and I hope you'll be watching us to see how we do and give us your advice and your counsel. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to... Uh I don't often like to refer back to that year, the year of the roof. <laughs> 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 
when I had uh, uh, the privilege of being chairman of the school board. But uh, <laughs> about the same time, uh, we began to hit the, the present budget difficulties from which we haven't uh, emerged. And, uh, you know, I look back on that and uh, the comfort and guidance and the, the steady hand and the tiller uh, down at the high school while I had a lot of other things, uh, you know, bothering me is something that I remember and I'm grateful for. I entertain a motion. Rosemary. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the resignation submitted by Frank Miles, that's high school principal. Do I hear a second? I will second it. No one's going to second it. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Again, thank you, Frank. Uh, nomination of administrators for fiscal year 94. I explained in my agenda notes that we normally do this in, uh, I think it's June. I've got to look back over my timeline, but usually uh, at the end of the school year, which is really consistent with the way in which the evaluation cycle goes. Um, however, there has been a change in the statute for principals, and we are advised that we should be uh, putting this item on our February board agenda. Uh, since I really didn't get to it in February, decided to do it in March and explain to you that we are really establishing a new cycle um, and that I will be putting it on the board agenda in February next year. And I will continue the evaluation cycle as a year-to-year -year cycle. Um, that list is Rick DeFusco, high school assistant principal, Nancy Hutton, middle school principal, Phil Jewett, middle school assistant principal, Beth Henderson, Ponco principal, Nancy St. John, Ponco Assistant Principal, Keith Weatherby, Part-Time Athletic Director, Wayne Doerr, Director of Special Education, Sue Weatherby, Director of Community Services, and Janet Hoskin, Assistant Director of Community Services. Uh, all but the Community Services people are part of a bargaining unit, so there are no salary figures here. I gather you, as a, the board representative, representative and the administrative representative, will be dealing with that sometime before the end of the year. Entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations for administrative contracts for the 1993-94 school year. Do I hear a second? Can. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? 7-0. Uh, leave of absence. Uh, I don't have a, uh, a letter here, but I explained in the um, agenda notes uh, that Barbara Connell had uh, been to 